Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum, dear viewers. Welcome to this session of uh, Mizan lecture series. Uh, you would recall that uh, before the month of Ramadan, we were studying Ustaz Javed Mughamidi's book, Mizan, which is basically his understanding of Islam. And we have studied various chapters like the political sharia, the economic sharia. And uh, currently we were studying the social sharia. And today we'll, in fact, uh, be taking our last lesson from the social sharia. And the all important topic that we are going to discuss today is the issue of slavery, which, in fact, Islam inherited at the times of the Quranic revelations. So uh, up till now, you would recall the, the chapters that we have studied or the section that we have studied in the, in the social sharia. They include nikah or marriage, which, of course, uh, uh, details out some of the important conditions of marriage and at the same time it also uh, gives us an insight into the marriages uh, of the prophet and we also find as far as this issue of marriage is concerned what are the prerequisites and what are the conditions we studied uh, relations prohibited for marriage which are basically divided into three like relationships which are prohibited by virtue of lineage uh, then we have relationships which are prohibited uh, by virtue of fosterage and finally by marriage itself. So these relations uh, which are prohibited, for example, uh, blood relatives, which are uh, which of course uh, are mentioned in this regard, and then other uh, details have also been sorted out. So the third topic that we discussed were the bounds and conditions of marriage. Uh, and the fourth one included rights and obligation of the spouses and both Rights and obligations, of course, they had been dealt with in detail because on these rights and obligations depend the uh, prosperity of the family. Uh, fifthly, we studied polygamy, which, of course, is something which was rampant in the times of the Prophet and it was limited to a certain number and also made conditional to justice. So we had discussed that as far as an ideal family is concerned, the Almighty created Adam and Eve to signify that it ideally comes into being through the union of a single husband and wife, and it is only through, in, in certain condensed circumstances, that you know, this institution of polygamy uh, is allowed. Sixthly, we studied the etiquette of sexual intimacy. Again, this is something of a very important nature because there are a lot of misconceptions uh, regarding this uh, topic, which is like a taboo topic. It is seldom discussed, and there is also a lot of disinformation found regarding sexual intimacy and uh, education related to sex, which of course includes education of our children as well as adults. Uh, seventhly, we studied ELA, which is a particular form of separation in the times of uh, Prophet Muhammad. Uh, it in fact uh, is a form of uh, oath in which would a person would swear, uh, he would take this oath that he will not have uh, any sexual relation with his wife and the Almighty warned them that they have to come to a certain decision and they just cannot leave their wives into a limbo. So they either must continue these relations or gracefully withdraw from them. So this ELA is basically an oath which is which was taken by the by people to not have sexual relations with their wife. And then we discussed Zihar, which was a particular form of divorce in again again the uh, times of Jahiliya, in which a person would regard his wife to be his mother, and therefore he would say that just as his mother is prohibited to him, the wife is also prohibited. So this also, this custom was also rooted out, and people who would persist, they were prescribed with certain punishments and certain atonements. Uh, we also discuss directives related to widows, which of course uh, are a very, very weak section of society. So widows, they have to be taken care of, uh, not, on, not, not only by the state, but also as an extension of the directive of a person who has passed away and his uh, duty to look after his wife continues for one more year when he passes away. And the Quran says that he must provide or make a will to provide one year's residence and maintenance for his wife so that she's not left high and dry. Eleventhly, we studied the norms of gender interaction. This, again, is a topic which has caused a lot of confusion and misconception. So we would discuss how uh, these union or this interaction between men and women who are unrelated, how the Quran deals with them and how it does not at all uh, foresee a segregated society, which is more of a cultural thing. It, uh, it envisages a society in which men and women, they can work together, they can live together, they can sit together, eat together, and they have to observe certain norms as far as this is concerned. 
Twelfthly, we relate. Uh, we have discussed directives relating to parents. This, of course, also is something very important because parents, particularly when they reach old age and they become jittery and, in fact, they become more childlike. Uh, that children who are adult, they are they are born, they are admonished that they must not be disrespectful to their parents in any way, because this is uh, the right that they have on every child. Remember, when the child was was being reared by them, was being groomed by them. And they were they would tolerate and put up with all sorts of tantrums. So it is not befitting at all. If now the parent needs such attention, that the children should speak to them in uh, in such harsh tones. Thirteenth, uh, the thirteenth uh, topic that we discussed was related to the orphans, which of course are a weak section of the society, especially in the times of the Prophet, when once a person's father would die, he would again be left to the mercy of his relatives. Of uh, and of course uh, many other uh, many other relatives, which of course they, although were part of his tribe, but then he was or she was dependent on these relations. So the Quran has copiously discussed orphans at various instances and said that they must be taken care of, they must be provided for, and if it is easier to provide for them by admiring their mothers, then that too should be done. At the same time, uh, at another instance, it is also said that if you have to look after these orphans as guardians. Then remember that a guardian who is rich must not in any way benefit from the money. But a guardian who is poor or is not able to look after himself in a way, but he has to uh, maintain that, that, that orphan. So he can benefit from the money of the orphan just to sustain himself and not consume it, thinking that uh, the orphans would soon grow up and then he would have to hand over the money back to him or to them. So this is a general overview of what we have discussed uh, in the past uh, weeks just before Ramadan. So today, as I said, we will be discussing the last topic of this social sharia. And inshallah, next week we'll be beginning with another one. And the topic at hand is the issue of slavery. Now, this issue has uh, been a sore thorn, I would say, uh, in Islamic directives. And the general view about it is that today, if there is a war between a um, non-Muslim nation and between, uh, between Muslims, then slaves can be captured and not only captured, but women from the opposite side or the warring enemy can be captured and they can be made uh, slave, slaves to the conquering or the warring army distributed among them. And they, these soldiers or whoever they are assigned to, they can have uh, intimacy with them. They have, can have sexual relations with them. And generally, this is the view that as far as slavery is concerned, this is uh, something which, they, which Islam still envisages. It still uh, propagates and says that if there is a war, then we can capture the women of the warring army and treat them as our own slaves. So, so much so that I'd like to hit to you an incident in the times that I was growing up in our university days. This is about 40 years ago, maybe. I remember our physics professor who was a very, very educated person, a PhD from a foreign university, a very uh, true scholar of his subject, and someone who was very serious, someone who always took his subject very seriously, and he would teach us in a very, very efficient way. So he once walked into our classroom, and I remember it was, it was perhaps 1984, which is like 40 years from 40 years ago. And this was a time in which the uh, in which the Indian and the Pakistani armies were uh, were facing each other at the border. And I remember Indira Gandhi was the Prime Minister of, of India. And it was at that instance that uh, we, we were actually spending days. And I, I remember it was the month of October also, incidentally. And it was October of 1984. And uh, so our teacher merrily walked in one day. And before he even began his lesson, he said that, well, if there is going to be a war between India and Pakistan, I'm going to capture Indira Gandhi and make her my slave. And all of us in the class, we were shocked. We were shell-shocked and we <laughs> didn't know what to say that here is a professor who is such an erudite person, such a learned person, not that religious, so to speak. But when it comes to slavery, when it comes to making someone slave, such is the rampant nature of this uh, concept that even a person like him uh, had the audacity or had this uh, desire to say that, well, if there is a war between India and Pakistan, he will make Indira Gandhi as a slave lady. So uh, the, the shock that came to us, of course, 
Uh, I mean, that shock is still continuing after 40 years. Whenever I recall that incident, it sends goosebumps uh, down my skin. And it also goes to show that how deeply rooted this uh, issue is, that even people who are not that deeply religious, they think that this is a right that they have, and Islam has given sanction to slavery, and have uh, we have uh, to have intimate relations uh, with slave women. Let me also point this out, that the reverse was never the practice in the times of the Prophet. So, uh, for example, uh, men, slaves who were men, slave men, they were never uh, intimate with their uh, women masters or mistresses, uh, so to speak. So this custom in, uh, in Arabia to have sexual relations with slaves just was confined between the master and his and his slave woman or slave lady. Uh, it, it never happened between a, between a mistress and her uh, slave man. Uh, another thing that I have found uh, in many societies today is that uh, people who have domestic staff, uh, I mean, they are domestic staff, they are cleaning ladies, they are cleaning maids who come and clean uh, or who do these chores. So I have also seen to the to my horror and to my utmost horror that uh, they are, uh, I mean, the, the man of the house, the, the head of the family, he would justify his sexual relations with the maid by saying that she is his uh, slave and uh, because slavery is something which is permitted in Islam, so if, even if she's not captured in a, in a war, uh, so what? Uh, it, she's still a domestic servant or a domestic attendant. So I have seen how this directive has stretched to domestic staff as well. And not only being stretched, as I said, it is justified. So to our horror, of course, uh, now comes this important part that we have to see and discuss that how come uh, an inhuman institution, which is, uh, which so to speak, was something that we should have thought or we would have thought that Islam has come to totally eliminate it. Uh, we end up finding that it is part of our Islamic directives, a very important part. Every single person that you will discuss this issue in uh, with you, uh, uh, whenever you will discuss it, especially with the clergy, you'll find it that they are in favor of this. Uh, not only in favor, they think it's a, it's it's a thing that we have to do. So prisoners of war have to be captured, and those prisoners who are women, uh, they can be distributed among the army and uh, assigned to soldiers or wherever you, know, you can send them. And this marital extramarital contact is something which is uh, which is pros which is not proscribed, which is absolutely allowed by religion. Now, uh, let us look at how the Quran has treated this topic and also see that what exactly is the situation. Now, as far as what I'm going to present today before you, uh, I must also at the outset say that this is uh, how Ustaz Amin Yasser Islahi, who is the teacher of our teacher, Ustaz Zawad Ahmed Ghamidi, has presented this point of view in his uh, celebrated treatise to the Badi Quran and shown that how uh, this uh, institution of slavery was never part of Islam. And unfortunately, it got mixed up and uh, certain directives in the Quran which were given at a very specific, with a, with a very specific context, they somehow prevail, and people thought that slavery uh, was something that was part of the Islamic uh, Islamic Sharia. The the cause of misconception, it seems, uh, is that slavery was gradually eradicated from the Muslim society. So it was not that it was eradicated all at once. I mean, there are directives in the Quran about which we know that uh, we know that. For example, the Quran says that we must not eat pork, we uh, must not uh, eat anything which is uh, not slaughtered in the name of God. So, for example, these are directives which are given and followed instantly. But as far as slavery was concerned, because it was a deeply rooted phenomenon in the Arab society, because it was part and parcel of the Arab society, you see, there were scores and scores of slaves in every household. And not only slaves, there were generations of slaves living in a house. For for example, the grandparent and then the next in kin and so on and so forth, like, like many generations would inhabit the same household and they would become part of the family. And also their own moral repute was not that strong. So the slaves, both men and women, uh, the way they were kept and the way their moral conduct, wa conduct was, uh, it left a lot to be desired. So had an instant directive been given to liberate these slaves, uh, men would have had no option but to become beggars in the society and become an uh, economic burden on the society. And women would have, or these slave women would have turned into prostitutes because this was what they were doing. I mean, not as prostitutes, but as mistresses of their 
of their masters and uh, they would have opened up these uh, dens of prostitution and uh, this whole uh, institution would have now would have become more prospering in the, in the society so an instant uh, dismissal or an instant eradication eradication of this institution would have resulted in a huge catastrophe in the society so islam actually adopted a gradual way to eliminate the institution of slavery keeping in view its deeply rooted status in the society and as i said had it done an had it given an immediate directive things would have uh, taken a really bad shape so a very gradual process was adopted and various measures were taken gradually i'll describe them uh, to uh, before you today and basically this would be a summary of ustaz amin asnis lai's point of view and see that how gradually near the end of the prophet's tenure uh, a directive was finally given in which it was said that you, if a slave wants to get himself or herself liberated then for a certain piece of uh, work or chore or a guarantee that he or she would not become an economic burden then every person every slave man or woman who would demand freedom has to be given that freedom and no one can in any way uh, stop them from being liberated but this was a gradual process that was adopted so just to uh, give an analogy to you uh, social customs which are deeply rooted in a society they cannot be dismissed or they cannot be eradicated by a single stroke and that would as i just said would create a lot of problems and commotion in the society take the case of dowry which is part of many eastern cultures uh, especially india and pakistan and pe people who migrate from india and pakistan to other parts of the world so the dowry becomes a, becomes an essential essential part and this is something of a burden on the bridegroom's on the, on the bride's family actually the bride has to provide for the things that actually are the responsibility of the bridegroom so we we see in our society which is basically a poor society 90% of the people are uh, they have these wants and desires uh, over 50% are li living below the poverty line but if you have to get your daughter or your sister married then unless you give a certain amount of dowry Uh, that wedding is not going to take place and if you say that you're going to eradicate this custom by not doing so it's not going to sit well because uh, because when these brides they are they go to their homes then they they face these allegations and these taunts uh, so it's like a vicious circle if they want to do away with something it becomes still part of it and if you don't want to do it away with it then it's something which stops marriages from taking place because unless you have a certain amount or a fair amount of dowry uh, which costs a huge amount of money you're not able to uh, get your daughter or your sister married so for example if dowry is something that has to be uh, that this this has to be reformed or this custom has to be reformed then this cannot be done by a single stroke of uh, of the pen or maybe or a single ordinance because it's so deeply rooted that it will so take some time you'll have to change the mindset of people you'll have to make them realize that this is the respons responsibility of the groom not the bride to bring all sorts of things and you cannot make a demand and in fact it is against decency to to uh, ask for the bride's family to give a certain amount of furniture or these essential items of a household so you would need to do a lot of mind building a lot of uh, a pre uh, marital uh, you can you can say build up is required to change the mindset of the people and then slowly of course this evil custom would be rooted so in a very similar way because of its deeply rooted uh position in the arab society the quran adopted a very 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 gradual way to eradicate it so it took two very broad uh i would say measures and one related to the fact that no new slave would be made because you see the greatest source of slavery in the times of the prophet were these wars and slaves would be made by capturing prisoners of war and making free people turn into slaves whether they are men or women and then they would be distributed among the army so this is what this was one uh, measure i mean this was one area which islam needed uh, a, a, a very strong directive and the other area was about existing slaves who were already found in households in in, in a very large number so two distinct categories and two distinct separate surfaces must be understood so one was the creation of new slaves or the making of new slaves and the other was how to deal with existing slaves so as far as the first category is concerned in which making of new slaves was the issue 
So Islam gave a directive or the Quran gave a directive in which it immediately said that when there is a war between Muslims and the disbelievers, so this directive was revealed uh, close to the Battle of Badr. That was the first formal war between the Muslims and the Quraysh. So the Quran said, if there is if, uh, after this war, you cannot capture prisoners of war and make them slaves. So in Surah Muhammad, this directive was revealed that if you capture these prisoners of war, you must set them free, either through ransom or without ransom. This, in fact, meant that no new slave would now be inducted in a household or in the army. So every slave, every free person caught in a battle was to be set free either through ransom or without ransom. Of course, there was a, an exception in the case of uh, in the case of people who were war criminals. So about them, there, that was a, some, something else. Of course, they would be punished, but then they could not be made slaves. So as far as the induction of new slaves was concerned, Islam gave a, an immediate order. It did not adopt a gradual way because it was not needed. Any new slave was was absolutely proscribed, and it was said that if you capture any slave, any 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 prisoner of war, then he or she must be liberated either with ransom or without ransom. So this is this takes care of one category, which means that Islam meant business. It was serious in eliminating this inhuman institution uh, at all cost. Now the question that has uh, left us uh, to be to be tackled is that what was uh, to be done or what was supposed to be done with slaves which already existed or which already were found in various households in large numbers. So it is for this that Islam adopted a gradual strategy because they were part of every household. So remember, new slaves were stopped. And this, of course, had to occur in Medina because the first wars or the wars that prophet or the believers fought against the disbelievers, they started in Medina. So as far as the induction of new slaves was concerned, that was taken care of. Now comes this, this issue of slaves which existed in the Muslim society already. So for them, as I said earlier on, this gradual process was adopted. And this gradual process started off by a very, very emotional appeal from the Quran. And Surah Balad, the words are, Fakkurakaba, which means release the necks. It is as if these necks are under yokes and you have fettered them and you need to untie those fetters and set people free. So the Quran did not say liberate slaves. I mean, this was a common Arabic word or an expression that could have been used. Instead, the expression the Quran used was akkurakaba, which means release these necks. You have tied them. It's like this yoke of slavery around the necks of people. Just untie them and let them go. So it was more of, of an appeal, which actually was a signal of what was to come in the future. Let me also narrate before you how the Prophet uh, asked us that as far as this appeal is concerned, which the Quran has shown, uh, what he himself in this regard had said. So uh, he said that the, whoever liberated a Muslim slave, the Almighty in return for every limb of that slave would shield every limb of that person from hell. So again, as the Quran uh, had briefly spoken by saying the words, release necks or just liberate these people who are under the yokes of slavery. In a similar way, the Prophet himself urged people that they must uh, set free these people that are working with them in, in, these, in these conditions. And it says that in return for every limb of that slave, the Almighty would shield every limb of that person from hell. So that was, an, that was a huge appeal that was sounded. So this was the first step. This was the first measure which the Quran took in, in emancipating slaves. It was a gradual way and the first step it took was that they, this appeal was sounded in a very emotional way. The second step that was taken by Islam was that it underscored that slaves must be treated with kindness and compassion and sympathy. You cannot be harsh to your slave, you cannot treat that slave in any way which is subhuman, which is inhuman, or which is below his dignity. And this was this was again said in a very, very vehement way, in a very overwhelming way, so that people who have these slaves realize that these are not commodities, these are not assets that they own, these are human beings, these are living beings, and hence they must be treated at par with all these living beings. 
So the second measure was that this treatment of kindness, this treatment of uh, treating these slaves with humanity and compassion was made to pervade in the fabric of the society. I'm just going to narrate before you certain uh, narrative of the prophet as well, which actually uh, underscore uh, this kind treatment. So Abu Huraira reports that a slave has a right to food and clothing and he shall not be asked to carry out an errand that is beyond him. Again, something which is absolutely a fair thing that you must give him, the slave, whatever sustenance he or she needs and tasks which are beyond the capacity must not be assigned. So remember, this is basically a reminder uh, to us that in those times, the, this bonded labor, labor as, we, as we know, it was at its inhuman worst. And these laborers or these bondsmen, these slaves would be assigned tasks which would, would be literally stupendous. It would be beyond them. It were Herculean in nature and they would be expected to carry them out. But the prophet said that, no, you just cannot ask a slave of those times to do anything which is beyond his capacity. Then there is a narrative from Abu Azar Ghaffari. He says that they are your brothers. The Almighty has made them subservient to you. So whatever you eat, feed them with it. Whatever you wear, clothe them with it. Ever never asked to do something which is beyond them. And if there is such a task, then help them out with it. Now, this underscores a very important uh, area. And that is that they, their status must be enhanced. And how? If you, you are going to feed this, your slave with the same food that you are eating. And if you have to clothe him or her in the same way that you are clothing your own self. What would, this, would, what would this lead to? This would lead to the fact that it would become very difficult for people to keep slaves because if they have to enhance or increase their standard of living uh, and bring it closer to their own standard of living, this would become virtually impossible to maintain a large army of slaves and, and feed them and clothe them of the same standard. So basically, this had this underpinning in uh, be, uh, that as far as slaves are concerned, you must raise the standard of living, must not assign them to with tasks which are beyond them. And the purpose was that people would liberate slaves because if they have to uh, maintain slaves with their own standard of living, it would become virtually impossible. And this would actually result in them liberating and emancipating them. And then we have another narrative from Abdullah ibn Umar. He says that whoever slapped a slave or beat him up should atone this sin by liberating him. Again, telling us that how important it is to uh, treat the slaves in a dignified way. And if something happens of this sort, then there is no remedy except to liberate a slave. If you have been harsh, if you have been cruel, if you have something bad, done something bad to your slave, then saying sorry is not enough. You must liberate that slave. That is the only way out. Similarly, Abu Masood Ansari. So he says, once when I was beating my slave, I heard a voice from behind me. O Abu Masood, you should know that the Almighty has more power over you. When I turned back, I found that it was the Prophet. I immediately remarked, O Messenger of God, I release him for the sake of God. The Prophet said, had you not done this, you would have been given the punishment of the fire. Again, telling us that beating a slave or using this harsh treatment is something which is absolutely uncalled for. And if something of this happens then the only atonement is that you set free that slave uh, and nothing less. So this all in all shows that basically uh, the second step or the second gradual step that was taken by the Quran in order to uh, make people realize that as far as uh, slavery is concerned, it shall be soon totally proscribed. But steps are now generally being taken so that people get this hint and set them free of their own accord. So as, as far as, an, as another measure is concerned, that we come to realize that in cases of, for example, unintentional murder, in cases of zihar and similar offenses, liberation of a slave was actually regarded as their atonement. So this was a third step which Islam took, that if, if you have to atone for a sin, I mean, there could have been various atonements, you could have been punished for that, you could have uh, I mean, fed people, you could have clothed them, as is the case uh, in, in, for the atonement of an uh, oath. But another thing that was placed for this atonement was that as an atonement for certain uh, offenses, like, for example, zihar, unintentional murder, one of the atonement methods was that you must liberate a slave. So this again showed this clear intention of the Quran that slowly and gradually uh, the Quran wants that uh, people who are uh, sinning or making these uh, public offenses, 
One way to atone for those is that you have to liberate a slave. Another measure, and I would say this is the fourth measure that was adopted was that the Quran said that you should marry off slave men and women who are of capable age. I mean, if they are able to marry one another, marry them off because this would then again make them members of the society. And again, morally and ethically, they would have a higher status because if they are, I mean, lose character, for example, or they have this uh, moral misconduct in them, then by marrying off slave men and women to one another, it was a chance that they would be given to lead a normal life. Of course, this would be difficult for people to marry uh, men and women who have loose character. Uh, this is a cultural misadjustment. But this would have been certainly something that did happen and it, this could happen that men and women who were equally morally corrupt or had loser character, they would be wedded off to one another so that once again, they do not live in a life of sin and they live as proper husband and wife. And then we also find that if a person was to marry a slave woman of some someone, uh, great care was, was exercised. So the Quran has said in Surah Nisa that if you don't find uh, women from your own sort, you can marry slave women uh, who are kept chaste. So slave women were encouraged to be married to in case they were chaste. So again, this was something that raised the standard of living uh, of these slaves. Then the sixth measure uh, that was adopted was that as far as slaves are concerned, uh, fornication, I would say, uh, or let me just let, let me also say that as far as the sixth measure is concerned, there was a there was a head that was fixed in the public treasury, and that was that a specific head would be or a specific amount of money should be given uh, to the public treasury, and that money would be used to buy slaves and set them free. So that was another thing that was adopted by the Quran, that uh, as far as the money was concerned, the zakat money was concerned, it would be collected by the state, and one portion of that zakat money would be used to buy off slaves from their masters and then have them set free. And the seventh measure of uh, view that was adopted was that fornication was regarded as prohibited. Now, remember, it was these prostitution centers which flourished uh, in, amongst these uh, slave women, especially. And once fornication was proscribed and it was made a prohibited item or a prohibited thing, uh, this, again, was something that put a stop to it. And then we also find, dear viewers, that uh, uh, the Quran also changed our mental attitude towards slaves by telling us that we must not call a slave by the name slave. For the In the Arabic word, the word uh, used for a slave is ghulam, and the uh, female equivalent is amma. So instead of using these words, the Quran says you use the words that you use for free men and women, which is fata and fatat, or boy or girl that you would say, or a man or a woman. So it was prohibited that you would use the word slave uh, in order to address them. And this again went a long way in changing the psyche of people, as we all know. And it was actually said that people are should be treated as, as slaves of uh, 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 slaves of God and not slaves of any individual. Now, as far as uh, the Quran is concerned, these measures went a long way in eradicating and in changing the mindset. But then another drastic step, I would say, was taken by the Prophet himself. And he actually asked his cousin, Zainab binti Jahash, to marry his own slave, Zaid ibn Harissa, who he had set free. So remember, even if a slave was set free, the mindset about that slave would not change much. And still people would have this, uh, this baggage that, well, once upon a time he was a slave, even if he or she is now liberated from that, those shackles, what does it matter? In the past, he or she was a slave. So in order to curb this mindset, the Prophet actually convinced Zainab bin Tijahash, his cousin, of course, she was a very well-groomed, a very highly respected, a noble woman of the Arab society. And the Prophet said that, well, he would like his uh, liberated slave uh, boy, who was Zaid ibn Harissa, that she could marry him. And the, 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 the intention of the Prophet was that if a slave or a former slave would get married to a noble woman of the Arab society, then this would raise the standard of slaves and slowly they would, be, they would become acceptable in the society. 
yes, we know from history that this marriage could not last uh, much. And ultimately, Zaid ibn Harissa uh, had to divorce uh, Zainab because he thought that, well, he, she, and he, there is a marked difference between the two and he's not able to stare her in the eye and he's not even able to be a husband the way a husband should be. So that class difference uh, struck in his mind. He could not maintain that. And in spite of the Prophet's uh, pleadings, I would say, which I mentioned in the Quran, that please don't divorce your wife like this, because the Prophet knew the repercussions. But Zaid could not help it, and he ended up divorcing. But nonetheless, it shows how far the Prophet went so that he could uh, liberate or have the standard of living of these slaves uh, be uh, raised to such an extent. So these, these were the gradual measures, as I said, which were adopted for those slaves who already existed. And then one final measure that was taken by the Quran is something that I'd like to mention before you. This is mentioned in Surah Al-Nur, which is the 24th Surah of the Quran, and this is verse 33. It says, وَالَّذِينَ يَبْتَهُونَ الْكِتَابَ مِمَّا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُكُمْ فَكَاتِبُوهُمْ إِنْ عَلِمْتُمْ فِيهِ فِيهِمْ خَيْرًا وَآتُهُمْ مِمَّا اللَّهِ الَّذِي آتَاكُمْ And if any of your slaves ask for mukatibat, give it to them if you know any good in them, and for this, give them out of the wealth which Allah has given to you. So this term of muqatibat, it is used in the Quran, which means uh, an agreement which would be made between the slave the, who would aspire to become free, that he or she will guarantee by doing a certain task or certain chore that she will not or he will not become an economic burden on the society and live as a graceful person. So the Quran finally said, that every single slave who would like himself or herself to be liberated and be emancipated, set free, if he or she would guarantee this, which was called Mukathibat, then it was incumbent upon the master to liberate that person at all cost. So this is what sealed, I would say, the fate of slavery. It finally was the, it was the last nail in the coffin of this inhuman institution. So previously, we have seen how measures were adopted in which Gradually, it became clear that this institution is being proscribed, uh, but this is being done slowly. But finally, viewers, we can see that near the end of the Prophet's tenure, it seems that this directive was given. Now, the question here that might arise in your minds is that if the Quran is so clear, and if there are so many narratives which have, which have appealed to the emotions of the Muslims to liberate slaves, if this is so clear, then why is it? What on earth has made our scholars or, or majority scholars still believe that slavery is something which is sanctioned by religion. I think in my personal assessment, the reason for this is by not understanding two verses from the Quran. So one of them is in Surah Mu'minun and the other in, is in Surah Maharaj and both have the same, I mean, they have the same almost similar words. So it says that, and these, these verses say actually, that sexual relations between a person who is a chaste person, who is a pious person. So these uh, verses or these words occur when the Quran is enumerating the qualities of a believer, that how good he should be. So whenever uh, you'll find uh, these instances being narrated, particularly in these two instances, uh, you'll see that the words used are that they do not, they, uh, the words are, illa ala azwajihim aw ma malakat aymanuhum, that they do not commit extramarital sex except with their wives or with their slave girls. Now, this is uh, the this is the cause of misconception, I would say, because these two verses still exist in the Quran. And when you, when you find them in these two surahs, of course, you would say that, well, you can have sexual relations with your wives and with your slave women. Uh, how could the Quran uh, proscribe them when it clearly says so? So you have to understand, and this is the point that we need to be very careful of, that during the time that slavery was being gradually eliminated, remember that was a gradual elimination. So the door for any new slave was shut tightly when it was said that you cannot entertain any new slave, you cannot make any prisoner of war a slave. So that was the end of that. But for existing slaves, these gradual measures were adopted. And it was only later in the times of the Prophet when it was totally banned. But during that time, because of this gradual elimination, this sanction was still given to slavery. So remember, it was that transient period in which slavery had not yet been fully proscribed. But there was a tremendous movement against it going on that liberates slaves, make them equal to your status, do not call them as slaves, etc., etc., some of the measures that I have just uh, referred to. But during this time, although an appeal was being made, but 
slavery was still given sanction until, as, as I said, uh, the very last verses were revealed, which are the verse of Mukatiba, which I just read out before you. So during that time, of course, sanction was given because, as I said, it was not an immediate order of prescription or prohibition. So these two verses, be they became, I, to me, it seemed that they became the cause of this misconception that because Islam gives, has, has said that um, people can have sexual relations with their wives and with their slave women, uh, that they think that this is an eternal directive without realizing that these two verses were actually revealed during the time when slavery was still in vogue, but it was being gradually eliminated until that time happened. It was that interim period in which these verses were revealed. So without realizing that these were the interim verses for that period in which slavery was, although being, uh, I mean, through an emotional appeal, it was being eradicated, but still it did not stand eradicated until a certain point of time. And before that point of arri time arrived, this sanction was still given, this allowance was still given. And consequently, we find that the Prophet himself had a slave, uh, Maria, who was gifted to him by, by the king of Egypt. And I will discuss more about it when you have questions. But as I said, this was one reason that the Prophet uh, had a slave uh, woman gifted to him and he did not set her free. Uh, the reason, of course, that I have always uh, tried to divulge, divulge is that during the time slavery was being given sanction, someone had to show how to treat slave women. So the, the Prophet, it seems that it, she, he made it a point not to liberate her because that would have been not only disastrous for her because she had come from a foreign land, she would have no place to go back because uh, it was a custom in those times that you just could not, could not return a royal gift. And at the same time, of course, there was an example that needed to be set before Muslims that who were still keeping slaves, that if you have to keep a slave woman, then this is how you should keep her. And the way the Prophet dealt with Maria, uh, it speaks volumes of how he actually treated her like his wife, although she was not in the status of his wife. But the the uh, benefits that she enjoyed, the respect that she was, uh, enjoyed was no less, if not more. So, as I said, that is that those verses actually belong to that interim period. And without realizing that these verses belong to that interim period, scholars have made this, these two verses as directives which give an eternal guidance that you can have uh, sexual relations with your wives and with your slave women. And as I said, uh, this is something that belonged to that interim period. So with this, I come to an end to this topic and also with this to this whole uh, major topic of so social sharia by just summing this up before you that slavery was gradually eradicated and talking about that part in which slaves existed. But as far as new slaves were to be made, that was done by a single directive of the Quran that no new slaves would be made. But as far as the existing ones were concerned, they would be gradually eliminated because of their deeply rooted nature. And once this had happened, we know from Surah Nur that every single slave was given this permission or this given this uh, permit that he or she could guarantee his or her own freedom from his master and lead a normal life. So now we turn to you uh, and, uh, and we open this forum for any Q&A that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Shazad, for a beautiful explanation and clearing the misconceptions around this um, great, um, important topic. So now we are taking the questions. So if uh, please raise your hands if you have any questions or type in the chat. Thank you. Bisma Thirmizi, please unmute your mic and ask your question. So, Dr. Sareem, Salikum, uh, I just uh, got a direct question um, in the chat. That's why I'm asking you that question. Somebody just mm -hmm. asked that, is it necessary to recite the um, azan in the in the ear of a newborn child? And if it's important to say the surahs in sequence? Well, as far as the second question is concerned, if the questioner is asking about... Uh, Reading the surahs in the in the namaz or in the prayer. This no, is not... in the ear of a newborn child. In the ear of a newborn child. Okay, so as far as reading azan or the new uh, the surahs in the uh, newborn is concerned, this is a much later addition uh, than the prophet himself. The, the first few centuries are absolutely devoid of this tradition. It is something that developed much later. This is evident if you look at history. So uh, people today think that for a newborn, it is a part of the uh, ritual of a newborn that you have to shave his head or uh, give the azan uh, in his or her ear. I mean, both these, I mean, as far as shaving off the head is concerned, this is an entirely optional thing. It's more of, an, more of a hygienic thing that you might do. It has got nothing to do with religion. And as far as uh, 
uh, as far as reciting the azan is concerned again this is this was never found in the times of the prophet in, in fact the first couple of centuries are totally devoid of any such practice and it is a much later thing that got developed i mean it got in vogue and now it is as if everyone has it has become so famous and it becomes so uh, pervasive that everyone thinks that it is part of the islamic uh, rulings whereas it is ab absolutely not part of it okay thank you so much thank you thank you bisma Simanil Siddiqui, please unmute your mic and ask your question. Yes, Assalamualaikum, Dr. Shazad. A really Mayur interesting salam. lecture. Um, I just wanted to know, could you please repeat the surahs that are relevant to the topic of slavery? And if there's any additional book or reading that you might recommend, that's my one question. And my second question is, that if we were in, then today, in fact, sitting with uh, individuals and this topic was to come up, can we now safely assume after this lecture that uh, that it, indeed this is not a practice that is uh, uh, th that this is a practice that is misunderstood. The fact that uh, um, women slaves can be taken mm -hmm. in mod in modern in the modern world as we know it today to be used for um, sexual yeah. relations. So, as I said, yes, this is an absolutely fair assessment that you have made. But do have this, uh, take this with a pinch of salt and do remember that when you talk to people who are already religiously inclined, if they differ with you, they will differ with you because of that, as I, as I just said, the, that misunderstanding that because of those two verses which say that you can have relations with your uh, slave women, notwithstanding the fact that those two verses belong to that interim period, because they think that uh, these verses have an eternal, uh, so to speak, uh, circle of application. So they might not agree with you. So that is why I have presented their view as well. So before an educated audience, of course, you can present this and, and tell us, I mean, tell them that this is the counter narrative of the general narrative in which people think that slavery is rampant. So in fact, what I've just divulged before you is the counter narrative against slavery. And as far as these verses are concerned and the, uh, the, the necessary or the rele relevant uh, hadith are concerned, I will advise you to, to look up two sources. So one of them is the tafsir of the Dabari Quran of Ustaz Amin Asin Islahi. You'll find it in the English language as well. This is Surah number 24, Surah Noor. And he has written a chapter on slavery uh, during, that, uh, during that exegesis of that surah. And he has outlined all these uh, measures and Quranic verses. And the second source is uh, of Ustaz Javed Ahmad Ghamidi, his book, Mizan, also found in the English language, by the name Islam, a comprehensive introduction. So if you look up the chapter on slavery, there's a chapter which is, uh, which is on slavery. So he has also given some more resources uh, from Hadith literature, uh, which might be useful for your consumption. Thank you so Thank much. You, and, and last but not least, which particular surah did you say is miss uh, 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 misunderstood. Yes. So these these are belief. these are two verses from Surah Mu'minun, which is the twenty twenty uh, third surah of the Quran, and the other is Surah Ma'arij, which is the seventieth surah of the Quran, and you'll find the Arabic words as Walazina hum lifurujihim hafizun illa ala azwajihim aw ma malakat aymanhum, which means that these individuals are those who guard their private parts, who guard their uh, sexual organs, except from their wives and from their slave ladies. So these words are exactly the same in both these surahs. So these two, as I said, I mean, just repeating it again, that these are the, the two instances in which that interim directive was given. Because in those uh, that gradual period of eradication, the, the time of prescription arrived near the end of the Prophet's ministry. So during that time, uh, this, these verses had to be revealed that pious people are those who do not commit any extra marital relations. So uh, during that transient, pe uh, that uh, temporary period, having sex with your slave lady and with your wife was was uh, equivalent. I mean, it would be it would be as if you're guarding your chastity. You're not looking outside your marriage bond. But as Thank I said, you, this was also uh, for a particular period. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Sir Faraz, name it. Uh, please unmute your mic and ask your question. Uh, some of the people, they uh, ask uh, that the slavery should remain uh, uh, in recent period as well because mm. uh, if, a financial, uh, if, if a man doesn't have financial strength, 
then he uh, in the quran it was mentioned that he can marry with the slave woman so what should be the solution uh, in recent time because now slavery women is not available and at that particular verse deals with that part of the uh, prophetic era in which slavery was still given sanction so basically the two verses i cited they are exactly of the same era uh, in which the verse that you have cited occurs that you can marry slave women it these uh, this this verse also is of the, uh, it also belongs to the same temporary period or the same transient period in which slavery was given sanction it was allowed granted mm -hmm. eliminated mm -hmm. So uh, this is the third example that you have given. Besides those, those two verses, this is another instance uh, which belongs to that temporary era. It is not. A, this is not something which belongs to. So, but it was. Was it not not good that in in this recent time it is uh, because of not having marriage the problem uh, in our uh, uh, society is. Uh, arising because of uh, lack of marriages, late marriage, uh, creating problem in the society. Suggested by, by religion, for example, you can marry another wife. I mean, this is something that is the, suggest the suggestion, but to make someone a slave, as I said earlier on, the Quran has proscribed it totally. It has said mm. that you cannot make any slave because you see the only source for slaves were, were, were these wars. I mean, you don't have any slave markets anymore. In the time of the Prophet, the only source was these wars. But for these wars, the Quran had immediately said that you cannot make any of these uh, prisoners of war as slaves. So it actually shut the door to any new slaves. So, I mean, slavery just cannot exist because this was the only source. And once that door was shut, you could not have caught any new slaves. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see, today, people, if they think that slavery still exists, mm -hmm. they, still, they still think that today... Prisoners of war can be converted into slaves. That is the misconception that they have. I have tried to clarify this, that it, but in which the very first battle, which is the Battle of Badr, was fought, is narrated. It is said that you cannot capture these prisoners of war and make them slaves. You must set them free, either with ransom or without ransom. So what should be the solution right. Thank for, you. for recent time? Thank you. What should be the solution for recent time? Because now slavery is not. The solution is that if you have that extra sexual, maybe you should marry some, another lady, maybe, or uh, treat yourself. But you cannot go along and have uh, relations with with anyone. I mean, that is what the Quran has said. The only way out is to have a wife. Thank you, thank you, Doctor Shahzad. Um, there was one question that I had uh, was that we also learned that. Uh, the problem of alcohol was also uh, Allah sent gradually uh, uh, the verses of uh, uh, you know uh, that alcohol is uh, not uh, is prohibited. They they were sent they were sent like gradually. It was a, it was not a thing that was uh, banned or prohibited just like in one in one go. So why is that not uh, something that is have misconceptions or? Uh, around it but this issue has it so see, as, are there not any verses yes i understand so as far as alcohol is concerned it was always regarded to be prohibited these verses which speak of uh, its uh, prohibition they relate to that instance in which it becomes a culpable crime so you see there is a difference between a sin and a crime as far as it being a sin is concerned it is something which is mentioned in the previous scriptures also and the quran also speaks it uh, speaks of it as if it is a sin uh, however, mm -hmm. this gradual prohibition, I mean, in which it's, it is said that you do not go near the prayer place when you are drunk, and Lata Krabu Salata Vantum Sukara, our directives are similar. What they are trying to tell us that soon this drinking or alcohol consumption will become a culpable crime. It will no longer remain a sin. It will become a crime in which you'll be held culpable and you'll be, uh, I mean, given a punishment for that. So initially, it was just a sin. As far as these directives are concerned, they do not, I mean, mm. for the first time, tell us that Islam is uh, prohibiting alcohol. All that it tells us is that now this sin is now, is, is going to be, is now becoming, a, to become a crime. It will be treated as a crime and would be punished as a prince. Mm. 
Thank you. So how do we know that I, is this the revelation of the verses is during the time and, you know, because of the background um, or is it actually mentioned in the Quran that uh, that uh, tells us that these, were, these verse, uh, verses were specifically uh, revealed during the time when they were uh, the slavery was in the period of transient period. And these verses, specific verses were released when it was uh, completely prohibited. So as I said, if you look at the Quran, it tells us that this is a, a dirty, handy work of Satan. So in Surah Al-Maidah, it says, min shaitan, that this drinking and liquor and gambling, these are, these are the dirty, handy work of, the, of Satan, which itself tells us that it is something prohibited. Also, if you look at the Bible and the previous scriptures, you'd find something very similar. So you see, uh, right. anything puts our intellect into jeopardy, anything which makes us... Uh, uh, inebriated and become indifferent. Uh, it is it, it stood prohibited in the previous scriptures also, and the Quran has continued with that prohibition. The only addition that it has made is that now it it said that it will become a culpable crime. It will be punished as well. Right, I understand. Thank you so much, Doctor Shahzad. We will be concluding our session here. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Um, have a great rest of the day. Uh, Allah. Allah.